www.chesswessons.net. And I'm looking at a game from the Russia versus the rest of the world match held in Moscow in 2002. And this is a game between Judith Polgar playing Gary Kasparov. And so uh, Polgar opens up E4, and Kasparov is playing, uh, well, this is the Roy Lopez, so the, the Spanish game here. And Kasparov plays knight takes E4, and at this stage of the game, knight takes E4 is most likely, you know, after D4, and now knight D6, this is called the Berlin defense. And um, Kasparov has not really had the best of luck with the Berlin defense in his career. Um, you know, in this game, he played as black, and it didn't work out too well. And uh, notably, in his world championship match versus Vladimir Kramnik, Kramnik, um, you know, won the match in large part due to his preparation in the Berlin defense. So these are all standard moves. And H6, I believe this is called the Le Hermet variation uh, with H6. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm definitely more of a fan of H5. H6, you know, the idea is to pr protect the G5 square, I guess, but um, H5 just really seems a lot more logical because you know white wants to play G4, and so why not, you know, a lot of times black even plays H5 later anyway in this line. So it, it just seems smarter just to go ahead and play H5 in one move and directly try to impede, a, impede G4. So anyway, um, knight E2, this is a pretty common... You know, 94 was also possible, but 92 is a pretty common maneuver here, trying to maneuver a knight to d4, where it's going to control a lot of squares in the position. Also, Polgar was anticipating Kasparov after bishop e7, would play knight h4, trying to exchange this knight. So she wanted to go ahead and have this knight on e2 ready to, to bounce into the game. So bishop e3, trying to finish development, and now knight d4, you know, protecting the pawn and hitting the bishop on f5. So, g4. So, so here I think it's pretty clear, bishop e7. Black, you know, the Berlin defense is kind of like a big trap sometimes because black plays, often plays very slow. You know, he's got the advantage of the two bishops, but these doubled c pawns are, are pretty tough to mobilize. Berlin defense, very, very tricky, very tricky opening. And so, you know, a lot of times you wait and, and try to get white to overextend. And then when the position opens up, the power of the two bishops for black is really great. Or maybe, you know, black's got control of the H file, for example. But it's just such a weird opening. And, and all these waiting moves, um, it really doesn't fit Kasparov's style because it's not super active. But anyway, so knight to f5. And, uh, you know, black finally played h5 there. And bishop to f8. Undiv so black is, what is this, move 18? And he's got just the bishop on h7 is developed off the first, off the eighth rank. Black is in a little bit of trouble. So bishop g6. So, okay. Trying to open up the h file. And um, a couple of, you know, nice little check. Rook to h7. So now this bishop can to b4 maybe it could reroute to a5 to b6 but you know king g3 and um this is kind of the thing i mean the berlin defense because these pawns are so tough to crack black doesn't move any other pawns usually except for the h pawn so he doesn't have any weaknesses so so it's very tough for white to attack him but f6 here and this um really didn't work out too well i mean I, the idea, I guess, rook d8 doesn't work because white's going to snatch a pawn. And, um, you know, just a4, and this would also open this rook up. I mean, I, I'm assuming that's that's why. But, um, so let's see. f6, and I'll just bishop f4, a very nice reply by Polgar. I mean, f4 would not have been nearly as good. It, it you know it looks better maybe but on the surface but bishop f4 and all of a sudden black's king is really stuck in no man's land it's very tough for him to run away king f7 allows rook d7 not going to work too well and bishop f4 also clears the way to open the e file for the other rook 
So I don't know what happened. Kasparov now finally trades off that strong night. Rookie won an excellent, just a top class intermediate move. Trying to, you know, exploit the open position of, of um, Black's King here. And Rook D8 fails miserably. Check. And not Rook takes D8, but just Rook E2, and uh, that's going to be all she wrote. So Rook E1, fantastic. And this seems to be pretty much a forced line. So Bishop D6, King D7, um... A forced line as far as, you know, white is forcing black to play these moves in response. So C4, now C5 is forced. And here I thought it was pretty interesting, B4. I just, um, you know, B4 trying to... But I, maybe black can even get away with sacking the piece. I don't know. It seems very risky. But anyway, yeah, I, mean, I like the idea with B4. And the idea would be to, you know, open up another weakness here. Now these pawns look... Even worse, but instead, Polgar. I mean, this this is an extremely simple solution as well. Just take and rook e six, and um, you know, obviously, rook h six just doesn't do anything. Just loses another pawn, and so Kasparov tried rook h eight, and some some tricky stuff going on. So king c eight, not wanting to allow any checks later after rook d seven. So now rook d five. So Polgar has really played very well. I mean, this is really true to her style. She, I usually don't see her doing you know too much flashy stuff, but the sheer logic of her moves and her technique is near nearly impeccable. I mean, this is this is what she does. So throwing in a couple of checks by Kasparov and now King to e4, and uh, the situation really hasn't changed. If Rook e8, I mean. Whatever, I mean, rook e6, king f4 is even possible. b6, finally have to defend the pawn. And now, a nice maneuver, so rook c6. So the rooks seem a little bit clumsy, but, uh, you know, here, Kasparov, he plays king b8. Might look a little weird, but if king b7, now rook g6. And now white can play rook d7 with check. And once he gets a g7 pawn, I mean, the f pawn's just going to roll. So rook c6, and so, okay, this is what I mean. The rooks might seem a little clumsy, but Polgar gets them situated after rook c7. Now doubling the rooks on the 7th, you know, is famous for a reason. So no need to worry about this f5 pawn, as white uh, has just got such a, such a strong attack. So a couple of accurate checks, and rook takes g7. And after king c8, Kasparov just resigned. He, he gave up here because... He, he's going to lose just too many pawns. And his king is going to be a constant danger of getting mated. You know, it could be check, another check, and I guess something like this. And th this would really seem pretty elementary for a player of, of Polgar's class. Even in this position, I mean, who knows, maybe rook, rook f7. For example, trying to trying to defend, and even something like this. I mean, this is going to be really easy for White to win. So I think this game was uh, making some history as the first time the number one male player in the world in any sport. Apparently, this is what I heard in any sport. The number one male player lost to the number one female player in the world. So definitely a very interesting game by Judith Polgar. And, uh, you know, as I'm making this video, she's dominating the 2011 World Cup. So she's, she's still got it. So this is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net. And thanks for tuning in.